Good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies for the slight delay in starting. And could I ask, please, uh, Councillor Horridge Parr to open our meeting with a karakia. Thank you. Dear God, may this day go well in our work of all this work of this hui for today and at all times, so be it. Kira, thank you. Um, so now call for apologies. So I'll move that the apologies be accepted for Councillor Barker and Councillor Olson. Can I have a second, please? Councillor Tommy Hanna, all those in favour? Thank you. Against Kerry. Uh, also noting that Councillor Jennings is joining us online today. You can hear us okay, Councillor? Thank you. All right, so we have... Um, one member of the public who wishes to speak to us today, and that is Mr. Rudd. Welcome. Uh, greetings, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, the, the incumbents, people, especially the new ones, um, Monique. Uh, members that are of the, what do you call those people, operations, and also my peers, the people sitting there, they're my peers, okay? So I'm just going to talk off the top of my head, whatever. I am um, disgusted about a lot of things going on, and manipulation and everything else, and I would like the new incumbents to be very careful when they make deliberations and decisions of things that are not led by the previous incumbents, led by your brains and what you see, what you hear. So be very careful. So, and a good example of this on this agenda is talking about taking the time frame out to June 2023. And we heard that at a uh, workshop meeting, but, but Monique failed to tell us that, oh, she's got a May extended, which is on your agenda, to 2023. 24. Now, I've been in this game for 22 years, so about 22 years ago they should have paid me out $22 million to fight in this landfill. Now, what the public does not know, because of in-committee and confidential agreements, how much money is being paid out for all these consultants to keep on mitigating, 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 that arise the Hokio stream and the lake is so polluted with all the million spent on it. Now, I'm, I'm part of the NLG, which is the Living Landfill Neighbourhood Liaison Group. And I stand corrected. That was created in the year 2000 by the Commissioner for the Environment. All right? The other day, there was a meeting call for the NLG. And there was a manipulation went on that three so-called representatives of the NLG went to this meeting. But the NLG members, as a membership, did not even know a thing about it. Charles, sorry, you. And uh, uh, the NLG, you will see in the resource consent conditions, the NLG is in the resource consent conditions. So no, read that document. Charles, sorry, can I just, sorry to interrupt you, but the, the item that's on the agenda today is about process. It's not about... And as I say, I explain, especially to the new incumbents and some of the others in public who don't know what the heck's really going on, so they have to be enlightened to these things. Now, also, there's another group called the PMG, which does secret negotiations with council. PMG is not in your resource consent conditions. Right? So listen to what I'm telling you, and you can come and see me anytime you like, and I'll talk to you. 
I'll take you around the lake, I'll take you anywhere. I'm a hunter, fisherman, gatherer. Born up on the Maori world and the Pākehā world. I know about plants and everything else. So you want to know anything about the swamps and all the rest of it, you can come and see me. I will enlighten you. Huh? Kia ora tato. Yeah, part time. Any questions? I don't think so. Were there any questions for Charles? No. Uh, just through you, Your Worship, uh, I do just want to reassure the Council table that um, there's definitely no manipulation um, being trying to be achieved from Council officers' perspectives. But I also do want to just um, uh, give one um, fact. And so there was an accusation there that we had not provided information that the LTP amendment and the LTP full were options. Both options were presented uh, at the PMG and NLG meeting. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with Mr Rudd um, on that um, again. Thank you. Um, just to formally welcome everybody uh, this afternoon, uh, especially those members of the public who are here, uh, staff and um, those that are online uh, listening and watching us. Um, could I especially welcome um, Mr Gerling as the newly appointed chair of the Te Araho Fox and Community Board and congratulations on the appointment, um, John, and um, we'll no doubt see you at the table uh, in the future. So moving to uh, late items, uh, we do have uh, two late items um, and the reason for these not being on the agenda, uh, one is uh, the, the well, the, we could not uh, put these forward to, uh, they weren't ready in time for the agenda when it was published last week. One is that it was not anticipated that an appointment would be needed to the PRG at this time, which is the Procurement Re Review Group and you'll see the dates, again, it's date-related. And also, as um, I advised councillors yesterday regarding the uh, Communities for Local Democracy um, letter um, that was they want to uh, have endorsed by the Mayor, I did want to have your endorsement as to whether or not that proceed. So that, again, is a late item. They will be uh, 6.8 and 6.9 which we, we will receive after we've dealt with 6.4. Oh, so I do need to move that those late items be accepted. Uh, seconded by Councillor Brannigan. All those in favour? Thank you against. Carrie, thank you. Any declarations of interest? Thank you. There are none. Could I now move to item number five, which is the confirmation of minutes. Uh, that the meeting minutes of Council uh, the 16th of November 2022 be accepted as a true and correct record. Could I have a second to Councillor Boyle? Thank you. All those in favour? Against Carrie. Thank you. So, moving to our first report, which is um, 6.1, the future of Levin Landfill which is on page number seven. And Daniel, welcome to the table. So could, while Daniel's moving to the table, can I move 3.1, 3.2, that this uh, report be received and uh, is recognised as significant. Um, seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you. Against, carried. Thank you, Daniel. Afternoon. Uh, so I take the report as read, but really want to highlight the criticality of the timing decision. Uh, so the officer's recommendation is to engage the community uh, on the future of landfill as part of the upcoming 2021 LTP amendment, which would, would which would result in a decision in June of 2023. A lot of work has previously been undertaken. Our team is committed to the required delivery of information to our community and elected members to make that informed decision. <coughs> the timing of the elections, uh, establishment of a new council, means that the development of that shared understanding and an agreement on a way forward is dealing with quite a compressed time frame. We, that's, yeah, around this table, but also with the NLG, our EWI partners, 
uh, community members horizons uh, we met yesterday again with representatives of the PMG and NLG they expressed similar concerns around the speed that we need to move in order to make that decision they also reiterated though in talking through that process that previous statements at the wider NLG and PMG meetings around the need to just get on with it and make that decision so that was certainly reiterated yesterday and part of the process is ensuring that we get that alignment of decisions and information across the various groups including PMG, NLG and around the council table. I want to reiterate that the decision around the LTP amendment process um, until such time that that's made, be it 2023 or 24, the landfill will remain closed for waste. Uh, but we will see some increased activity over the summer period as we look to do some remediation work around the old landfill and also the capping on the existing landfill. We will bite, um, so subject to the decision today, um, we'll bite the next couple of weeks off in, in small chunks. So you can expect a briefing around the remediation options on the 30th of November. Our 7th of December workshops around waste, future of waste, um, the background to the landfill. Uh, 14th is a commitment around the BPO and 21 December looking to actually workshop the future of landfill options so we can get busy over that January period uh, preparing options to go out to the community. So reiterate the concerns um, from Mr Rudd and I, I certainly want to work closely with members of the NLG um, as we try and move forward on this together and it is around you know an, an, an approach to being transparent but also the fact that um, you know if we can't work through this journey together and move forward, um, you know, those decisions will be required to be to delayed further. So certainly committed, we're well resourced. Um, it's going to come down to how effectively we can work with our with our partners um, to bring it, bring them on that journey together. So a lot of work to do, and which was really the purpose of that session yesterday to try and lock in dates um, and is how we engage this side of Christmas subject to that decision being made today. So we're confident we can move forward and really run the direction from NLG and PMG that we need to get on with it. Any questions of Daniel? Thank you, Daniel. Oh, sorry, Sam. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just, yeah, my question, Daniel, is... Um, I guess it, it's a relates to a residual concern around option one is that I, I, can you give us an assurance that I guess by the time that we come to consider the options um, in December, that they are going to be sufficiently worked up, that they are going to be um, viable. You know, we, we're not cutting ourselves short in terms of actually um, uh, working up those options and, and that, that they don't just become sort of throwaway token options, um, you know, because I, what, what I am concerned about is that, that councillors might get to that decision-making point and say, well, yes, this option looks good on paper, but there is insufficient information or there is insufficient um, understanding of, of what this option actually might look like. So can you give us a, some, just some, I guess, some, some commentary or some assurance around, I guess, that we are going to have sufficient information in, in December to make some valid decisions around options. Yeah, so there is a larger team working in behind the scenes, um, preparing ourselves to that for that point. So that's around that wider business case framework to look at the status quo in a, um, in a comparative option assessment with the closure options. And we're busy working around that business case. Um, a lot of interviews out connecting with region, uh, councils from the wider region around current waste levies to, to certainly uh, ground truth um, what's happening in the wider market that we can then bring into, um, you know, into, that, into that business case process. So there's, there's certainly a lot of work being happening um, behind the scenes in preparation for that. And there'll be some subsequent workshops um, over, over coming weeks to start to to release some of that information as it comes to hand, but the framework's in place to deliver on that. It's just plugging in the appropriate numbers and, and reviews. Jeffy, you can watch that comment. Um, through you, Your Worship, if, if I can just, um, I suppose, manage those assurances with the commentary that we've provided to council and to the broader community to date, and that is um, that trade-off decision that council has to make around timeframes and the depth of um, 
I suppose, information we can get through between now and December. So in a, while we are absolutely working in a business case framework uh, and we're wanting to you know, do analysis of those comparable options, uh, as I've said to council before, and I just want to remind you, we're not going to be in a position where we're delivering you a better business case in December for those options. Um, but we're certainly going to be providing you what we think is set sufficient information in order for you to make an informed decision about what items you might consult the community on. Councillor Tommy Hanna. Um, kia ora, nga uh, mihi kia ako e nina i tūwhara tātou nei hui i te, I te wānei, um, e mihi kia ako te katoa. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, just a really quick question for me is, um, I just want to understand the iwi consideration or the, and the engagement because the, the process that I was a part of the meetings, I'm not really sure whether we saw that representation then given that you've had a new meeting. Have we had any further input from the iwi or the hapu in regards to the direction that we're heading around the amendment? So we've had um, some NLG representation historically um, and, and, th and through um, our representatives there. That, that is, um, and, and we obviously had Mo Puku at the previous NLG, um, but the message was you know, really you know, around the closure, the need to close the landfill, uh, to move forward and then start to consider longer term remediation options, um, not just associated with the with the old tip, but starting to restore the manner of that that area um, around the wider catchment, including the Hokia Stream and and up to the um, Natuka Wadu Marae. So there's there's certainly um, been some input, um, but obviously it would be good to to reengage in, in more in depth, moving into some of those mitigation options in the future, but. Really, the key message is close the landfill, and um, yeah, we can we can talk from there. Good, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I don't think it's. I think that's all. So we now um, have three point three and three point four. Uh, the council notes its obligations under section ninety seven of the Local Government Act to ensure that where a local authority is altering significantly the intended level of service for any significant activity, that decision can only be made where the decision is explicitly provided for in the long-term plan or the long-term plan is amended. And 3.4, that Council agrees to make a decision about the future of the Levin landfill as an amendment to the 2021 long-term plan enabling a decision on the future of the Levin landfill to be made in June 2023. Um, I'll move that recommendation as uh, Councillor Young is seconding uh, any discussion or debate. Councillor Browning. Yeah, thank you, Worship. And um, so I will support um, this option, uh, I guess with the reassurance from the CE and um, Mr Haig around the ability to um, cover all the aspects of the landfill operation that we've talked about for some time now uh, in many debates. Um, and I think <coughs> uh, to get comfort from that um, is the uh, workshop we had recently, uh, so the briefing with uh, the PMG, the site visit, um, and, and discussions with Morrison Lowe, uh, which uh, provided some reassurance. But I guess there's, there's still the concern, um, historic concern that... Um, um, that all the information needs to be on the table for us to make that decision at that time across every aspect of this operation. And I know, I know, note in the report there's still some uh, separation between other solid waste activities to this, and I accept that. Um, but I guess uh, um, there's reassurance from the CE and Mr Hay and the work we've, uh, we're doing and going to be doing um, in the next coming months is going to be crucial as long as it, along with that consultation. So, so I will support it on, on those provisos and. Um, Hope we get the right outcome at the end uh, with all the information on the table. Thank you. Council Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, look, um, I, in a similar vein to Councillor Brannigan, I, I, I initially had a personal preference for um, dealing with this as part of the 2024 LTP. 
Um, but I have to say my thinking has shifted um, over the last few weeks. Um, and that has probably um, come about because of the um, hearing, I guess, that direct feedback from the PMG, NLG, um, the pretty frank advice from the CEO and staff around, um, I guess, the, the, the resourcing um, implications uh, and, and, and the sequencing uh, of uh, necessary activities. But also, um, in you know, sort of discussing with with councillors and, and and getting sort of that read of the table, uh, but also cost, uh, and there's a pretty stark um, difference in in that cost amount between option one and option two. Um, and, and as I say, I, I, my my fear is was always that we would get to December uh, with an option one um, uh, direction and and get to December, and then councillors would be uh, put in a view, put in a position where there was simply insufficient information about options. But uh, with with the commentary from officers and the CEO, um, I'm, I'm in support of uh, option one. Thank you. Is there anyone that wishes to speak against option one? Because I think we've probably heard enough um, in terms of... Um, those that and both uh, speakers have uh, summed up uh, pretty well in terms of um, why option one should be supported. Um, so with those motions on the table, I'll put them. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you very much. So we'll now move to uh, 6.2, and which is the... Um, resurfacing of Donnelly Park Nipple Courts to seek direction from Council on whether it wishes to bring forward funding to renew the nipple service and fencing at Donnelly Park from 23-24 to 22-23. Uh, can I move uh, 3.1 and 3.2 that the report be received and this matter is not as uh, not as recognised as not significant. Do I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Proctor. All those in favour? Against Carrie, thank you. Welcome, Arthur. Welcome, Brent. Uh, thank you, thank you, Worship, and thanks for having us up to talk about this and also councillors. Um, probably not too much to add to the report. Um, suffice to say that we have um, had feedback from the group using the court that there are some concerns with its current surface and um, clearly in the interest of maintaining it in optimum condition. Um, uh, then we are uh, seeking some direction from council on whether we can pull the funding in uh, back from 23-24 uh, into this current financial year. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, just acknowledging there are some members of the Netball um, Association here. If there are any particular questions that um, you may wish to put to them, but I note that uh, some uh, Council of Grimstone especially had some questions which have been responded to through the Netball Association as well around numbers and, and uh, details. So if there are any further questions, there is uh, someone to answer them for you. There being none. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> okay, so um, we have 3.3. .3. The council bring forward $400,000 of renewals funding from 23-24 to 22-23 to enable the resurfacing and refencing of the netball courts at Donnelly Park. Councillor Tupapua is moving. I have a second at Councillor Grimstone. Any further discussion or debate? Councillor Well, Well, just briefly, Mr Mayor, um, front of mind for me is the, is the health and safety issue. I think that, that uh, determines the outcome for me. Also, we need to recognise that it's a very well-used uh, facility and as such needs to be fit for purpose, not only from a health and safety point of view, but just in terms of delivering a service that people can really enjoy. So I support the motion. Thank you. Put the motion. All those in favour? 
against Kerry. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance today. Appreciate your time. So, move now to uh, page 6.3, uh, 6.3 item, uh, page 41, uh, which is the advanced funding for the Horofanua Sports Turf Trust uh, to seek a resolution from Council to pay in advance its annual contribution of $25,000 in the 23-24 year for artificial turf renewal at the Halliwell Turf, Donnelly Park. This to meet potential shortfalls in the current budget. Welcome. Arthur, Jacinta, Amber, we've got the full A team here. Um, so move uh, 3.1, 3.2, that the report be received and uh, recognised as not significant. Um, uh, seconded by Councillor Young. All those in favour? Against carried. Thank you. Arthur, again. Uh, yeah, holds again, thanks. It does seem like too long as here before. But um, yeah, similar thing here. Uh, clearly, well used facility. Um, and there is a need to keep that facility um, in the best possible condition. Um, the Sports Test Trust have um, been managing that facility very well over the last 15, 20 years, or possibly more than that. Um, I would like to continue to do so, as I say, they're just um, looking for a little bit of extra help in terms of um, bringing uh, next year's um, uh, money forwards to this year. Happy to take any questions. Um, also acknowledging the fact that we have um, Mary and Cheryl here from the Horofana Sports Trust as well, um, and the hockey team to answer any questions as well. Um, I think just a couple of questions from me. In terms of we've provided some money, well, we've put aside money for the relaying of the, the, the turf, if you like. Um, some of this money, though, is used for the repairing of the lights. Is that, is that normal a part of a maintenance budget that we also provide for? We wouldn't normally provide for the uh, repair of lights. Just to be clear, the issue with the lights was more, again, about a safety one that was significantly corroded at the base. Um, so, again, it's not something that can necessarily be ignored. Uh, it needs to be in a, a safe condition. So we actually came to council, um, I'm not sure when it was, uh, a short while ago, and there was an agreement at that time to utilise that funding both for the turf renewal and for uh, the replacement or repair of that, um, of those light bases. Um, and my other question, I suppose, um, in 10 years' time, we're going to have to or 10 to 12 years' time, replace the turf again. Is what we are putting aside sufficient to cover what that might be in 10 to 12 years' time? Do we need to sort of think about in a, the next annual plan increasing that figure? Uh, certainly the original agreement was for replacing the turf, which has been um, done over at 2010, I think it was last time. But certainly the Horofanua Sports Turf Trust also um, raise funding for uh, that, so it was part funded last time. I'm sure they'll be keen to do it next time, but it probably is round about time to review um, whether uh, the money we're putting aside at the moment is sufficient for what will no doubt continue to be into the future. A very busy site, particularly with growth as growth um, hits as well. Any further questions? Councillor Brennan. Yeah. Question for Jacinta, please. So good. Just in terms of bringing the, the money forward for the, similarly to the previous, similarly to the previous item, does that, other than the, the very small increase in the rate, does that provide any other financial challenges for for the organisation? Through you, Mr. Chair. No, it doesn't. What we normally do is rate twenty five thousand dollars a year. That then goes into a reserve and sits there over a period of time. It earns interest over the time that it builds up. So effectively. Um, it, the turf was able to fund a little bit more than would be the normal turf replacement, which Arthur mentioned last time because there was a little bit more sitting there. Um, so in terms of the impact, it was really just an impact on borrowings and then an interest impact of, of that being um, taken a little bit early. So not a significant impact. Councillor Jennings. Yeah, thank you. Just a question to Jacinta. I'm assuming that in terms of the options, it's option one that is the most straightforward option and that option two and three uh, still do involve some um, ad, sort of administration, back office um, paperwork. So 
in terms of a, a recommendation from you, is it, is it correct to say that option one is the most straightforward and probably preferred option uh, of offices? It's definitely nice and simple. Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd be happy to move option one then. If, uh, Thank you. If you I was just yeah. waiting for someone to do that. Thank you. Um, seconded by Councillor Brannigan. Uh, so the, um, the recommendation is that Council resolves to release in advance its contribution of $25,000 in 2324 for the completion of the necessary works. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any debate or discussion? Councillor Grimstone, uh, just one commentary just to acknowledge the additional information that both Netball and Hockey put forward to the officers to answer the queries I raised. It was most useful in helping me inform my decision. So thank you. Put the motion all those in favour. Against, carry. Thank you. Now I move to 6.4 on page 53. Uh, so this is um, this is a regular paper to update the elected members on the number of current matters and items of interest that affect the council's financial position and require council approval to progress. Uh, it includes changes to the capital program for 22-23. So move 2.1, 2.2, that the report be received and recognised as not significant. Uh, seconded by Councillor Boyle. All those in favour? Against carried. Welcome, Jacinda and Daniel. Thanks. I'll pass it over to Daniel. Is that it's, there's only one um, impact for this, so I'll let um, Daniel talk about the, the project. Afternoon. Um, so around fluoridation, just really highlighting that this request is for the funding um, to get underway with the procurement of some works that have been directed um, by the Director General of Health under the Fluoridation Amendment Act 2021. So we are expecting that um, we will get a funding application finalised and confirmation of that in December this year. So effectively it's fund the project but also get a return on, on that. Um, so fully funded um, through central government. Uh, noting that that is a rather polarising subject for our community. Um, over the last week, we've updated our website, so there's a lot of information that links um, that the community can be referenced to. And following today's meeting, we're also looking to get a media release out just to really um, have publicised that out in the community that uh, this is a decision that really has been taken out of council's hands and um, a, a directive from the central government. And we're one of 14 councils in this round. At this stage, there is no... Um, plans or funds currently allocated for the remainder of our water supply, so it is just targeted at Levin and Ohau currently, uh, but that is the yeah, sort of current status of play. Any questions around that? Happy to take. Deputy Mayor Allen. Look, I, I understand that this is not discretionary, fully understand that. The question is around the funding. Um, the report is a bit ambivalent. Uh, you've said it from the table now, Daniel, that you are confident that we will get the funding. I think I heard you say, and yet in the report it says that it's not yet certain that we'll get the funding. So it's a million dollars. I just would like some assurance around whether we can or cannot be certain that we'll be reimbursed by the government. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex one with timing that um, in order to deliver by July 23, we do need to commission um, that process to, to get the works underway or you know, in terms of design and get that contract lined up this side of Christmas, which is why the push was to get this across this meeting. Uh, there, would, there would always, I suppose, be a hold point um, if we didn't get the funding in December. And as a council, we need to go back to central government to, to rattle some cages around the, the reasons behind that. But, you know, we're under, we understand it's a... It's a process that we need to follow in terms of a formality to, to get that um, recouped, uh, but just the timing is a little bit out of sync in terms of the gap that we have in the confirmation of funding. So the application is due in by the end of this month, uh, and there is a you know a, 
a direction to come back before Christmas. So, we, you know, we would have, in theory, um, confirmation of the funds before the physical works were well advanced in the new year. So I can't give you a 100%, uh, but it is a, a process that we're going through to acquire that funding. Yeah. Daniel, my understanding was that the Ministry of Health had set aside a fund of about approximately $11 million for those 14 councils that they had directed. So obviously it's, you know, that'll be divvied up um, probably population size wise in terms of the, the report released um, has highlighted, like they did pre-engagement and we sit within the budget that was allocated for our, for our region. So it was a signal quite early, but it's just filling out that we have had to go through a process to confirm that that original fund that was put aside was sufficient. So we've done that. We've gone through a procurement um, review group process. We have a, a, a specialist lined up um, who specialises in that area. Uh, they're committed to doing the work in the time frame. So we've now you know, confirmed their price, going back to the application to say, yes, we can do it for that value. And we expect a response to say, OK, here's the, here's the funding. Um, so it's really a, a you know, confirming the, the ins and outs financially that we're going to commit funds from council, but an intention that the revenue would then be reciprocated from the allocation that's there for us. Kessler to Papua. Uh, question about the operational cost ongoing, like CapEx, you build it for a million dollars, but how much to continue? I mean, I'm familiar with the lip and water treatment plant, so I know it's probably, you know, just an add-on, um, not going to be too much of an increase to serve it, um, deliver it, but what about the source of the fluoride? How much does that cost? It's it's certainly in the tens of thousands, but it's not significant um, in terms of the chemical. I can come back with the exact values. There's been a, a number of options that were looked at um, in comparison with other councils. So we actually went around and met with PNCC um, and Lutra, who are doing the work, um, have quite a lot of experience. This is not the first council uh, to roll that out. And we were settled on uh, for this um, particular, um, you know, the, this particular treatment is a chemical called um, hydrofluorouric acid (HFA), and there's a, you know, a a ramping up from the supplier, so they got an early awareness that you know there was a, a market expanding in the country, and they're certainly looking to supply that. Um, you know, it's obviously important once it's installed. Um, that they keep that supply chain running. So there is you know, certainly good market security and um, you know, process around that. But I can come back with the exact uh, dollar estimates that have been factored into our OPEX. Councillor Jennings. Uh, thank you. Uh, Daniel, just with regard to the table on page uh, 55, uh, where we have um, obviously uh, allocated additional budget and brought forward... Um, uh, budget from from later years. I just wanted to get some commentary around. Is there anything on that list where you do not have a high degree of confidence that we are going to um, stay within the allocated budget? Like, as in, do you are you anticipating on any of these projects having to come back to us to ask for more money? In the infrastructure space, um, we've got a high level high level of confidence. Uh, we are intending to come back to the February Council meeting for an update on the Capital Works Program, but I could uh, I could certainly rattle off um, currently where we are as of today, if that would be helpful for the to answer that question. I guess I'm I'm just looking for in terms of you know how confident should we should we be with um, the the budget allocations that we've that we've um, made and, and brought forward. In terms of that list, are, uh, you know, is, is uh, are there any projects there that are on a sort of a uh, watch list, or, or you know, that we've got some concerns around that we might be exceeding budget? Um, because I guess that's what I'm really tr trying to sort of manage and understand is is what is the what is the next uh, few months look like in terms of completion of these projects? Because I would imagine that we'd have a reasonably high degree of certainty, given that we've signed commitments and contracts. But is there any of these projects on this list that we, you know, we think, well, actually, uh, there's still further cost escalation that, that could um, give us a surprise um, in coming months? 
uh, no, nothing on that list. There is a um, obviously a paper coming to the 14th of December council meeting around options for landfill remediation. Um, so I would see that as as the um, as a potential mover. But across the wider capital works program, um, which we set a target budget of, of 35 million, uh, we're fairly confident um, in terms of the roading aspect. We're around four million into an 11 million dollar program. Uh, Surf Club, Pods Road, consenting processes on track to, to meet their targeted budget. And we're in the process of an, even today um, looking at a paper around the, the sewer works, King's Drive. And you know, in terms of our work history in the area, we're certainly well advanced for this time of year. We've got active um, sewer and waterworks projects in Livin, Foxton, um, Cambridge North, uh, Tararua, around, and, and, and works out of the pot. So Although we, um, you know, in terms of our, our run rate graph, uh, we're tracking to, to hit that 35. Um, you'd look to see a you know, fairly significant increase in the summer and all of that procurement work that we've done over the winter period is, is starting to line ourselves up to, to meet those budgets. So quite a high level of confidence around that, but no significant overspend signal at this point. Chief Executive wishes to add a comment. Um, through you, Your Worship, so just a note for the February Council meeting, we do intend to bring um, quite a detailed re-forecast around our capital program. You've obviously heard from um, Mr Haig that we are feeling pretty confident about our ability to deliver, um, but there will be the odd project, Councillor Jennings, where um, you know, due to sequencing or timing of things, and we anticipate that that February report will provide Council a really good deep dive into that. Councillor Prickner, I just wanted to come back to the funding from Ministry of Health. In approving this, does this put us in a better position? Does it provide more commitment to the Ministry of Health to secure the funding or get us higher up the priority in that process? It's it's more around our ability to deliver. So then we, we do need to create a balance sheet of investment and, and revenue in, in terms of our processes to commit a, a contractor. So that Contractor is, is ready and available to, to get underway with works, and it's you know if there was a delay, and we need to come back in the new year, um, it just does start to impact on that timing. But we we don't expect that this would um, this would impact any prioritisation with the ministry funding. Um, however, if we were to allocate funding for future um, supplies in the likes of uh, Foxton or Tokamaru. That, that signal by council to fund those may impact on our ability to get funding. So this, the reason we're on the, the list for this time around is that we hadn't allocated funding and this was a, a mandate from central government. So there's a, an assumption that it would be funded alongside that. Further question, Councillor Tikupa? I think I'll just save it for my um, debate. Okay. The other question I have, um, Daniel, is are we putting ourselves at risk of not receiving as much money from the Ministry of Health if we are actually allocating the full project amount in our budgets already that they may decide, well, you know, they're prepared to spend up to a million dollars. We'll only give them half of what they need and, uh, rather than the 85 or 90 percent that they might have given us. The, the, the message that um, I'm receiving from the team who have put this together is no, that this money, there was a million dollars set aside for this um, for this treatment. So yeah, it's, a, it's a timing thing that we need to, to secure the contract to deliver the works. Okay, so um, we now, any further questions? Sorry. Um, thank you, um, Daniel. Thank you, Jacinda. Um, 2.3, that council approve an additional capital budget of $1 million to provide for the fluoridation of the live-in water supply. Do I have a mover and seconder? Happy um, Councillor Boyle, seconded by Councillor Proctor. Any debate or discussion? Councillor Tupper. Uh, just that I'll be voting against um, this Based on principle, I don't support fluoride being added to the water, therefore I won't be supporting spending money on implementing it. Um, and it's really 
comes down to a couple of things. One, lack of consultation the government has had with the community. It's a mandated, it's not an option, not an option for us. Um, and frankly, their, well, their cause makes no sense. They say it's for children's teeth and the children are targeting a Māori, actually. Um, kids like at Taitoko School where I went. But the problem is uh, not because they're not necessarily brushing their teeth, it's they're drinking, you know, their, their diet, they're drinking the wrong um, stuff. And, um, yeah, straight up, you'll see them um, go to this before the, the water or the, the, the milk. But And some of that's too expensive these days anyway. Um, and... So that, and, and the other thing is that the source, I'm not comfortable with the source of it because it, it is fluorosilicic acid, which is of the fluoride options or types there are, that's the worst, but it's actually cheaper, which is why um, councils use it. And um, there's no measure of how much each person is, is taking. So I, I've done a speech the last time this came to the table and... Um, I've got the video of it if anyone's interested of my reasons and, um, you know, extended version of it. Uh, and, but what I will say is when we workshop this, like um, Councillor Mike Parker mentioned, oh, you know, you know, tap water, drink, drink it. But for me, for someone who bottle feeds their baby and I've got to put water in that over and over again, and it's hundreds of mils at a time all day long, I'm not sure how much she's taking. And, and there are families that can't afford to buy their water because that's what he suggested. If you don't like the tap water, go buy water. But there are families who don't have a choice. So that's all the water they, they can, yeah. Anyway, I won't be supporting spending a million dollars for this. Deputy Mayor Al, look, just a brief comment from me. Um, I happen to hold a different view when it comes to fluoridation. For me, the science is settled, but I fully respect uh, Councillor uh, Urahiri's views have been consistent. However, it is essential for me that the table support this motion because it's not about whether to fluoridate or not. It's whether or not we want rep recompense for an action we have to undertake. Mm -hmm. If we vote this motion down, we are liable for a million dollars. CAPEX before we even get into the OPEX uh, to, to do what the government has decreed we have to do through the Ministry of Health. Councillor Young, um, just regarding the media release, uh, I believe it's important that we state that this is a central government directive and also in plain language because I do get a lot of uh, members of the public ask me about this and I think it should be that said quite plainly that it is very central government directive. And also, if they uh, provide in that media release information on what they can do and who to contact regarding it, uh, if they have a different opinion. So noted. Um, okay, so the motion's on the table. Uh, all those in favour? Sorry? Can I call a division? A division, certainly. You may call a division. So uh, for councillors um, that are new, uh, division's been called for, which means that our votes individually are recorded. And I will go around the table and ask uh, each councillor whether they vote for or against the motion. Uh, and it will be recorded by the meeting secretary next to us. So starting with Councillor Brannigan. For. Councillor Tommy Hana. Councillor Tukapua. Sorry, just use your mics, please. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Young? Against. Councillor Hori Pa. Four. Councillor Grimstone? Four. Councillor Boyle? Four. Councillor Proctor? Four. Cal uh, Deputy Mayor Allen? Four. Thank you. And I am four. Sorry, Councillor Jennings? Yeah, four. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. So the motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, so now moving to the first of our late items, uh, which is 6.8, and 
Do members have handouts? Yep, they do now. Okay, so 6.8 refers to the um, to appoint a councillor and an alternate to the Horofano District Council Procurement Review Group as required by the Council's Procurement Policy adopted the 14th of September 2022. Okay, so um, just moving 2.1, 2.2, uh, that we received the report. Um, uh, sorry, 3.1, 3.2. The report being received and is recognised as not significant. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen. All those in favour? Against carried. Um, ben, welcome to the table. And Ashley, is there anything you wish to introduce uh, the topic with? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bernie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, with reference to the point in front of you, Ben, can I just ask you to uh, raise the voice level a little? Sorry. <laughs> sure thing. Um, yeah, with reference to the report in front of you, which is titled The Appointment to Procurement Review Group in the LA Agenda, um, as part of the procurement policy which was adopted in September of 2022, the Procurement Review Group, otherwise known as the PRG, was formally approved to be established as a governance over procurement conducted on behalf of the Horofenua District Council. Along with members of the executive leadership team and key council officers, it was recommended and decided to have an elected member as part of the PRG. Having an elected member on the PRG has many advantages, with a particular emphasis on being open and transparent, as well as the ability for officers to be questioned for aspects of procurement. Towards the end of the last triennium, after procurement policy adoption, Councillor Jennings was informally appointed by fellow elected members to join the PRG. Given a newly elected council, it is appropriate to have an elected member appointed based on the current representation, as well as the opportunity to appoint a substitute member. As only council has the authority to appoint and elect a member, we are here today requesting for this to be conducted. Are there any questions? Um, just for the sake of elected members' information, it's my view that the chair and deputy chair of the Risk and Assurance Committee should be the two members that be appointed uh, to this. So if you have any further, um, you know, just so that you're aware of my intention to um, to nominate uh, those two, just in case um, there are any further questions uh, uh, regarding uh, Ben or Ashley on this. And I think um, from my understanding is that already um, it's been most beneficial for the procurement re review group to have an elected member on uh, that. And Councillor Jennings may wish to add um, a comment uh, in that respect, if he wishes. Yeah, look, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, uh, well, I, I would say that I don't, I don't know if it was valuable for them, but it was certainly valuable for me. And um, um, what I was going to suggest is that obviously when um, council comes to consider matters um, in committee around procurement, um, I think having had an elected member involved uh, in the PRG will provide, um, I, I guess, um, a further um, opportunity to, to I guess, answer and, and, and provide some assurance to to colleagues around um, the fact that certain matters were considered and, and that, that things were talked through uh, at the PRG. So um, I, I just uh, sort of see it as a, an additional layer of um, assurance and um, I think it'll be most valuable for the table. Thank you. So any questions for Ben or Ashley? Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ashley. So I'll move that Councillor council appoint Councillor Jennings to the Procurement Review Group for the 2022-25 term and name Councillor Olsen as an alternate should that be required. I have a second from Councillor Young. Any further debate? Put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Second item... Um, that we have to deal as a late item is 
uh, which is the endorsement of a draft mayoral declaration for communities for local democracy. Um, so can I move that uh, 2.1 that the report be received and 2.2 recognised as not significant? Uh, seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen. All those in favour? Against Kerry. So, as you are aware, I thought this was opportune arriving yesterday um, that with today's council meeting that you were in a line of sight in terms of what uh, communities for local, local democracy is thinking in, in terms of where they should go um, and that um, there needs to be some sort of mayoral consensus um, from uh, the members of community for local, local democracy so that it does... Um, set out their um, views and objectives and opinions. Um, obviously, the weight of uh, mayors uh, in the country supporting this will hopefully mean that the government will uh, relook at some aspects of uh, the reforms. Um, but just wanted to ensure that you were comfortable endorsing um, the communities for local, local democracy directly declaration is attached. So um, I'll move that the council support the Mayor's endorsement of the Communities for Local Democracy declaration is attached to an appendix A. I have a seconder from Deputy Mayor Allen. Is there any discussion? And noting that I've had several um, uh, responses back uh, from the email that I sent yesterday in support of this. Um, but is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Councillor Grimstone. Um, just for clarification, there isn't any legal binding agreement to signing a declaration that stands in front of us or any risks in front of the council we need to consider? None. <laughs> the lawyer um, might have a different opinion. Um, look, there certainly is no legal um, obligation uh, on council, but um, Councillor Grimstone, I think I heard from you um, about your question was related to risk as well, and so I would just highlight to council that um, with all of this, um, there is reputational risk, um, and that reputational risk is associated probably acknowledging that Three Waters is a very polarising topic, uh, and um, you know, we have councils already. Um, particularly one of the mayors who's led the mural declaration where the council was split on the mural de declaration. So it's just that acknowledgement that it's a polarising topic, therefore there is reputational risk, but you can look at that both ways, whether you choose to endorse the declaration or not. Councillor Proctor. Uh, I'm a little unclear exactly what we're signing up for here. I mean, I know that we're sort of supporting your uh, signature on this document earlier. Um, but are we being a little bit hypocritical in the sense that we are supporting, we are receiving some Three Waters funding and at the same time asking to change that system as well? Uh, you're quite right. And um, even joining Communities for Local Democracy wasn't a unanimous decision around this table when we did join. But um, the consensus was that we felt that there needed to be a message sent to the government that they needed to... Uh, re-look at the, at the reforms um, and this has been a, um, a matter of some discussion within communities for local democracy that um, uh, you know the, the decision to accept monies uh, and, and um, you know for what they're imposing on us and then saying we don't like the reforms does seem slightly hypocritical uh, you're right uh, but the, um, for the benefit of our communities, uh, we are accepting that money, I suppose, in terms of making sure that we can um, put into place some projects that we would never normally be able to do without that funding, but also in respect of a, some of our community who are saying that they don't agree with the Three Waters reforms in their present status. Um, we are um, also supporting that. And even Communities for Local Democracy uh, agree that some sort of reform is required. Um, so there's no, um, there's no dissension in terms of that. 
it's just the way that the forms are packaged that they don't necessarily agree with. If you may, Al. Just to add to that, and it's a, it's a very relevant question, but I don't call it so much hypocritical as fighting fire with fire, because that same government said that there will be an opt-out clause when this whole process began. Uh, they then forced us all to opt in. So it gives me absolute pleasure to put our hands out for what will total around $20 million when phase two comes in, given that the government uh, was, to use a phrase, hypocritical to begin with. So I'll put the recommendation, all those in favour? Against? Noted. Council Proctor and Council Horridge Power against. Thank you. Motion is, or well, the recommendation is carried. So now moving to um, 7.1 on page 57 of your agenda. Uh, the purpose of this report is to receive, is to present to Council the organisation report for September, November 2022. I'll move 2.1, 2.2 that the report be received and recognised as not significant. Seconded by Councillor Brannigan. All those in favour? Against? Carry. So I'd just like to invite the Chief Executive to introduce this report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillors, we've heard for some time um, the call for improved reporting um, that provides an overall snapshot of what the organisation's up to. Uh, how we're tracking against our SSPs is identified in our long-term plan, uh, how we're tracking financially, but also how we can, um, I suppose, tell the story a little bit about some of the great work that happens across the organisation. Um, this is uh, the organisation's first attempt uh, of our first organisation performance report. Um, and while I apologise about the size of the report, um, I think the initial intent was that this would be no more than 40 pages. I think it gives you a sense of the huge scale of work and the breadth of work that happens in so many pockets of our organisation. Uh, it is just a snapshot though. Um, so, um, But it's a great way for um, staff to be able to demonstrate um, what has happened and I think that if we kind of thought about it that if we had one of these reports come into every council meeting by the end of your training if you put all of those reports together that should actually tell the story about what you as elected members and what this council has achieved what we've um, overcome uh, and what we might still have to face um, uh, in those three years. Uh, you will note that um, given the changes in the committee structure we are the responsibility of finance now sits at this table rather than the former Finance Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, we have bundled the financial reporting into this report uh, and I'll hand over to um, Ms. Strakerson who will um, just talk at a high level um, about the financials. Uh, but if I could just um, make a couple of comments about um, the report. Uh, you'll note that there are a number of SSPs where we are either on track to achieve or we're already signalling to you that we're not going to achieve um, those measures. Uh, and I think that there's a conversation uh, as we lead into the 2024 long-term plan about how we, um, how we write levels of service or how we write SSPs in a way where A, we know that we can achieve them, um, but B, they mean something to the community uh, in terms of what we'll ultimately deliver. Uh, but we'll particularly draw your attention um, to you know, what is a growth story near the end of the report. Um, and no doubt elected members have drawn the linkages between that growth story and some of the metrics that we're seeing in our building and planning um, consenting activity where we are starting to see a drop off. Um, and you know, when we talk through the financial zone, uh, obviously the income associated with development contributions um, you know, they are a concern, but I think that we need to keep that front of mind in terms of the revenue assumptions we've made around development contributions and coupled with what might be a slowdown in growth and development, what that might mean for our revenue assumptions and funding um, the core infrastructure over the next few years. Uh, so with that, um, I'll hand over to Ms Straker and then together we'll take questions to the report. Thank you. So just a couple of points to make probably in relation to what 
um, Monique mentioned before was around the growth story and around income. So when you look at um, our income statement so far this year, we are tracking below where we thought we would by about $4 million. So the key drivers for that are the fact that in the in the capital space, we haven't, there's some um, capital program that we've got planned to do, particularly the Tarahika one is a significant driver as well, and some of our roading projects that haven't started yet. And so that, that capital um, income won't yet come until we, we begin those capital projects and start to see some of that coming through. So when we come and um, discuss this with you in February, we'll give you a more detailed view of all the capital projects what we'd plan to do in terms of the 53 odd million that you've now approved in terms of potential program and the $35 million that we've committed to being able to complete. And you'll be able to see at an individual level what we now think we'll be able to complete. As part of that as well with the grants and subsidies, you'll be able to get a sense of where that income's coming from. Is it still planned to come in as we thought it would? So that will continue to come through. Um, as well in the growth space, you'll see there that the development contributions um, is in the low hundreds of thousands in terms of what, we, what we've what we got so far. But just reminding you as well, though, that doesn't mean that we haven't, we've had significantly lower developments be starting and, and through the process. We don't actually invoice those lots until they get to the 224 stage. So it's not, it's not that they haven't, they're not in train, but it's that they haven't reached the end stage at, that we would start to invoice. So that's just to flag to you that that's a key reason why that, that there'll be a lag in that space. In terms of fees and charges, we're tracking well, but as in the regulatory space, we're probably close to 300,000 below where we thought we'd be or where we plan to be at this stage of the year. So again, in terms of monitoring the growth, that's something that will continue. You'll continue to see through the reporting, so that you can get a sense um, of where we're at in that space. One thing you may have noted as well in the in the rate space is that we've we've got a bit more about three hundred thousand dollars more revenue in the rates area at the moment. That's unusual in that space, um, and that's really around water meter income and us negotiating with some of our commercial suppliers and making sure that we're recovering. Um, funding for their use of the water. So that's that's what's driving that in that space. If we then flick into the expenditure side of things, so you'll note through all the projects that uh, the activity managers would have talked through how they're tracking in their space, um, but we've, com we've completed about $9 million of the capital program at this stage. So um, close to roughly around a third of where we, where we thought we would for the year. Um, and then in terms of expenditure, um, Interest continues to be, and I know every time you turn on your radio, um, you'll be hearing it as well. Um, so the OCR is continuing, or the official cash rate is continuing to be something that not only worries households, but also worries us um, in terms of our treasury program. So we've got about $250,000 worth of additional interest expense so far this year, but it's something that we are very conscious of, and as we work through the Risk and Assurance Committee that will continue to be something that you'll see regularly as a feature in terms of making sure that we're monitoring our risk in that space well. The last point just to mention is around expenditure and and it's another thing uh, for this table that we'll need to make sure we're aware of and that's around the costs associated with weather events. So for us there's just over a million dollars that we've incurred this year um, related to pumping, related to weather events that have meant we've needed to do things that we wouldn't have otherwise um, planned or needed to do. So those continue to be um, significant costs for us um, that we need to manage closely and need to continue to have conversations with this table about potential reprioritization of spending if they... Um, head in any trajectories that are more than we thought. So for example, um, if there are a number of a, a number of more events that occur during the year, then we might need to have conversations um, with you about changing where we think we need to spend our money to either keep borrowings in check or to keep our expenditure in check. So just to, those are probably the key risks that you need to be aware of in terms of the finances, um, but happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jacinda. Any questions of either Jacinda or the Chief Executive on the report?
Okay. It'll be none. Um, can I just though, acknowledge uh, the report? Um, because I think it is a, um, a fantastic way for us to um, keep our community informed about the many good stories that are happening um, within this organisation and the district. Um, I know that there will be some improvements as time goes on, some of the formatting and things like that, but um, I think it's um, a, a great start and uh, look forward to um, a further reports in the coming meetings. Councillor Browning. Yeah, no question, just a bit of discussion, acknowledge what you've just said and, and um, certainly uh, acknowledge that. Uh, I think mainly for me, we look at page 17 of the report um, around local elections. I just wanted to acknowledge publicly the, uh, the effort and, and the work the CE and her team have done around the inductions for the particular the new members. Um, yeah, there's a massive amount of work um, and some pretty scary stuff in front of all of us. And uh, I think um, from someone that's been here a little while, um, I think the work that's been done to uh, welcome the new members and get them in the, in the, the, around the table and I guess comfortable in the surroundings um, has been extremely helpful and um, would like to have experienced that myself perhaps once. <laughs> but uh, uh, just want to acknowledge that public because I think it's important. Thank you. Lessons have been learned, you could say, yes. Councillor Grimson. Uh, just a commentary. I, um, I agree with the CE's um, view that this report becomes a storybook around what Council has achieved. Um, for future reports, um, I'm just mindful of the time frame that goes be between each report. The, if the commentary or an additional way of capturing the trend in that particular period between this point and that, um, could be a focus as well because that will enable us to continue to keep reading the story as it, as it unfolds. Good point. Councillor Jennings. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just one question um, for Jacinta or the CEO on page 63, just talking about property disposals. Um, you've obviously mentioned about the, you know, tracking the um, assumptions around revenue around um, DCs. We also made some quite significant assumptions around um, revenue from property disposals uh, in the long term plan, uh, including across the first three years. I just wondered whether, as part of that um, capital delivery um, report back in February, or, or perhaps even separate to that, we could have some um, advice around how we're tracking in terms of the property disposal space, because obviously that's going to have an impact on uh, borrowing capacity and, and um, um, yeah, just just keen to get some, some, some understanding around that, please. Sure, that's absolutely fine. We can bring that as part of that report. Okay. So... Uh, we have a recommendation 2.3 that having considered all matters raised in the organisation performance report September to November 2022, that the report be noted. We have a second from Councillor Horry to Parr. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Moving to 7.2, um, the mayoral report on page 167. Um, Move 2.1, 2.2, that the report be received and recognised not significant. Um, seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen. All those in favour? Against, carried. Um, for new councillors, simply a record of um, some of the things that I've got up to over the last uh, month or so. Uh, but it's also, um, I'm more than happy to receive um, reports uh, that can be included from councillors in this report about some of the um, liaisons or, or some of your appointments to statutory bodies that you have that aren't reported through the normal council, uh, whether they're community wellbeing or other other committees, but um, for them to be included in this report, it is for public information. So um, uh, if you feel that there is some information that you would like to be um, included as part of this report, please um, let us know. Um, this report is done about 10 days before um, the agenda goes out, so um, it does need to be in a timely fashion. 
Um, and obviously, uh, if there are any questions that you have of me and what I've done, uh, more than happy to also uh, respond to those as well. Okay, so moving to uh, 7.3, uh, which is page 169, Council Resolution and Actions Monitoring Report. Uh, to present to Council the updated monitoring report covering resolutions and requested actions uh, from previous meetings of Council, uh, 2.1, 2.2, that this uh, be received and recognised as not significant, seconded by Councillor Boyle. All those in favour? Against, carried. Thank you. Any questions uh, relating to this report? Yes, please, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Jennings. Um, just a question to the CEO. Um, I'm just trying to reconcile the um, the first line in the table, which is uh, reference 21.502, with some commentary on page 97 of the agenda, which is the organisational performance report, just around the Waikawa Beach access. So in the, in the organisational performance report, it almost, my impression was that there's there's almost focus on one option or one solution there, uh, whereas obviously there was um, it was anticipated through in in terms of that um, resolution that there would be some further uh, optioneering um, and and that there would be some further discussion around what what are the possible options. Can you just provide some commentary on that and and that yeah I guess just specifically addressing. How, we're not going too far down the track in terms of that. What's what's captured in the organisational performance report? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, no, Councillor Jennings, your re recollection uh, is accurate. So, um, officers have engaged expertise to help in crafting some options, but there certainly is not a view on one option. Uh, and of course, our commitment um, not just to uh, Ngāti Wehi Wehi, but also um, the Waikawa community is we need to work with them, um, acknowledging that there are varied opinions in that community about um, what the best outcome might be. Councillor Proctor. So just to clarify, there's still more consultation with the local community done at the undertaking? Um, through your worship, I don't think we've begun consultation uh, with the community. So yes, the consultation needs to um, commence. Mr. Mayor, could I just have a follow-up question? You may. So, so um, uh, to the CEO, would, would you envisage that the LTP 2024 would be the uh, framework through which options might be formally consulted because there potentially is some corresponding budget that would be uh, required uh, in order to implement various options? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, that's correct, Councillor Jennings, although I would note that there is uh, an amount of money from memory, it's $200,000 uh, in this year's capital program. Um, and I'm not saying that we're going to spend that because obviously we're not going to spend it unless there is a solution that this council table have endorsed. Uh, I'd also note that the timing um, needs to be lined up with the Horizons Regional Council. Uh, I myself went on a site visit um, maybe six, eight weeks ago with Horizons Regional Council and some of the community um, just to kind of hear their concerns. And it's very apparent that um, we've got some work to do to clarify roles and responsibilities um, with Horizons Regional Council, but to think about how this can be looked at a bit more holistically, where it's not just about beach access, but it's actually about the coastal management plan uh, and some of the ecological and environmental concerns that that community has and how they can be enhanced through a broader project. Council to if, if I may, it's up to you. <laughs> I provide a very brief background to new councillors about how this came on our agenda. Sure. Uh, or, um, you know. So, um, Currently, the Waikawa Beach um, public access is across Māori land, and it's a whānau, I think, maratana um, from Wehi Wehi Marae, and it's been that way forever, basically, and they're happy, they're fine about it. 
up until recently, last term, where um, obviously the, the streams and things like to do their own thing. Um, and then some public brought it upon themselves to change the pathway on land that doesn't belong to them without asking. And that's when the whānau got upset. So then it was get council involved, um, find a resolution. But um, it was corrected and some concrete things were put in place. But I guess long term, it's about us working with all interested parties about, you know, ongoing access that's appropriate and safe for all. Thank you. That's good background. Councillor Browning, thank you. Just referring to 2022-28, uh, the local faction, uh, probably a question from Mr McCorkendale, really. I, I accept the work is ongoing and I think a target date there, 28th of February or something like that. That's something I've been um, probably inundated with uh, conversations recently uh, up in the Kirikiri around, once again, uh, the local faction assessment stuff and the costs, etc. Uh, is the work that's ongoing, is that, uh, and I know we've been there, it'll be quite confusing for probably the newly elected members, but the work that you're doing, Mr McCorkendale, is that in any way going to streamline some of those processes that uh, you know, developers or uh, people wanting to build properties are being subjected to currently? And, and along that, probably more the, um, the difference in opinions of engineers, etc., um, and the um, uh, yeah, and the, and the costs that are being faced. Is, is the work you're doing is that going to help plateau that, streamline that out a little bit? Because if that makes sense, um, and maybe we need to have it off, offline, but um, it's just want to bring that attention because it's getting difficult. Perhaps a short answer now would be that the work that's being undertaken is to. Uh, to put it simply, I guess, try colour in the rest of the, the liquefaction map. So how that potentially helps streamline the processes. Currently, there's parts of our district where liquefaction mapping hasn't been undertaken. So therefore, it falls on the individual landowner to then go and um, ascertain what level of liquefaction risk is there and then what type of foundation is required. Where we are able to provide mapping, uh, that will take a step out or potentially save uh, an applicant from having to, to go through that process of doing investigations to get that uh, but if the mapping is obviously showing a certain level of risk it won't necessarily save them from needing to put in a certain type of foundation to uh, mitigate that risk but through um, the worship you your worship I probably the key thing is that this work doesn't relieve council of its obligations to the new um, national guidance around liquefaction, what it does is hopefully mitigate and streamline some of the steps um, our customers will have to uh, engage in. Thank you. Councillor Tommy Hunt. Just wanted to um, just clarify around 22166 um, de Mola. Is this an issue council are going to address or is this an issue... Um, that the Fox and Community Board will be picking up from this point. It says we're not on target there around the variation to the existing lease arrangements. I'm not sure who I'm asking. <laughs> um, kia ora. Um, uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, so this is a um, an item and direction that has come previously from the Fox and Community Board, recommended to Council, and then Council have given direction to officers. Uh, uh, officers... Um, have done some work in transforming the, um, the old tram storage space. Uh, what is off track is that we don't have a current lease. Um, I'm confident that council officers have done everything they need to do to ensure that there is a lease available um, to be considered. So the reason it's off track is that we have not, we're not in a position to have had a lease signed and that's something that we're continuing to work with the Windmill Trust on. Okay, so we will now um, move to 7.4, which is the Council Forward Work Programme. 
and 2.1, 2.2 that the Ford Work Program be received and the uh, matter is, not rec- is recognised as not significant. Seconded by Councillor Boyle. All those in favour? Against, carried. And the Chief Executive might wish to add some comment to this report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, elected members, just to note uh, that on that um, Ford Work Programme, uh, obviously there are likely to be additions between now and the actual meeting on the 14th of December. Um, but what is missing from that report and should be noted is our intention to bring the report around the restoration of the old dump um, and the funding and commitments associated with that. Uh, happy to take any questions. There are none. So we will now, that brings us to, oh, sorry, Councillor Jennings. Sorry, Mr Mayor, just to be annoying. Um, there is one of the um, paper reports that's to be brought is around the Oxford Street plane trees. Um, and I had noted on page 104 of the agenda, there's obviously reference to um, some potential litigation risk around that issue. And I just wanted to get some understanding of uh, what the intent of the report is uh, and whether, um, again, this is around options to deal with a particular issue and, and whether there is scope, um, whether offline or, or now, to um, sort of signal some of the options that we're hoping to see as part of that report. Uh, through you, Your Worship. So um, the intention of the report coming on the 14th of December is to ensure that all e- all elected members understand um, the issues we face around um, those trees. Um, the give a summary of the years and years of conversations that have taken place uh, and provide advice to Council on the mechanisms available to Council um, to try and solve the problem, um, noting that the trees are um, notable trees in our district plan, so they're protected. Uh, and um, fundamentally what it comes down to is we have no money in the budget to advance any work around any mechanisms to resolve the issue. So first and foremost, it's seeking um, direction from the council table on your appetite uh, for community consultation associated with the trees um, because uh, our view is that all options have an association with the Resource Management Act process and require full public notification. But in order for us to embark on that, we require funding from council. So it's a decision around funding, but it's also a decision around direction. Uh, We would absolutely love to hear um, if there's any perspectives or kind of insight from elected members ahead of the 14th, um, preferably probably by the 2nd of December, because we've got to write the reports by the 2nd, um, on options or additional thinking that you'd like to see in that report. Uh, Happy to um, make sure that we can cater for that. Thank, thank you. I, I guess I'm happy to signal right now pretty quickly that I, I, I guess I'd be keen for the report to address whether removing them as notable trees from the register is, is a viable option and is in what's involved in, in that. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jennings. And that is one of the options we'll be providing you advice on amongst um, a couple of other options. Look forward to that debate. (laughs) (laughs) Councillor Tukapu. Through you, um, Mayor Burney, question to Chief Executive around um, community engagement, well, the improvement thereof, and and how we might go about that. I mean, the plane trees is one, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, bigger than that. And some thoughts I've had is, um, and that's because let's let's all admit that the large majority of the people out there have never even seen one of these before, so they have no idea what's on the list of things and decisions we're making today. Um, but one way we could put it out there, because they're not going to go on the website and look for it, um, 
in our community connection. That's just one example where we publish uh, in the newspapers and and by other means have the list of the topic or that just that front piece there. These are the reports we're receiving at the such and such a meeting. These are the topics and um, I guess if it sparks their interest, they might turn up and that might be a bit fuller. And um, given that we now start at one o'clock, there's the live stream option. But um, also I was thinking around every month, there's a number of media releases. I mean, councillors, we all receive what goes out, but um, they go to certain avenues and, and not all, every story is picked up and not, not all of the community are aware of um, those things. So if there was a not a register, but a list of these are all the releases that went out in October, November, and that was published somewhere or even just mentioned in your operational report. Then we know, oh, yeah. Because we know, but they, they don't know. And this, is, this should be all about the public community. So, um, through you, Your Worship, our Council took for great ideas um, and I can um, see Miss Campbell in the background um, writing them down. Also noting that, um, of course, Council have given us some direction around making sure that not just the minutes are available but that we do that, we do a better job at kind of summarising the decisions and what um, comes out of that. I, I think that um, just to kind of offer a um, a win. Um, obviously we've moved our community connection online and we're using our rates database um, which means that you know for the first time majority of households are receiving an email from um, from council and like it's it's at the moment it's a reflection of what's in the newspaper but over time there's a massive opportunity to think about how that becomes a lot more um, I suppose engaging and link back to the decisions of this table and the things that um, that matter to them. So yeah, look, happy to take um, that feedback on board and yeah, ha happy for um, any further ideas about how we can enhance that um, to be to be considered. Just to add to that, we're also looking at um, inviting any members of the public who are interested to become part of it if you like, a citizens forum, uh, where we will consult regularly with them about any issues that are front of mind. Uh, topical. Um, I'm also instituting uh, regular uh, opportunities for the public to um, meet and greet me um, at our community centres um, throughout the district, not just to Tapere, but also uh, Te Aoho and Shannon. Um, and position myself and be open to, for anybody to come and uh, have a chat. Uh, also noting that from next month we will also be having our public forum uh, session before um, council starts. So hopefully, you know, people, the public and the community will get the idea that there are plenty of different opportunities or avenues that they can connect with us and give us their feedback and opinions on any topic that's you know they're out there we are trying but it's certainly trying to do different ways of uh, connecting with them okay thank you so that um, brings us to the end of our open agenda and um, just move um, that we now move to exclude the public um, that we will be discussing um, the Levin Adventure Park lease, the procurement plan for the King's Drive Wastewater Articulation Renewal and the Horford Alliance Three Waters Operations and Maintenance Contract Extension Variation Agreement. So I'll so move that we do that. Could I have a seconder please? Councillor Tony Hana, all those in favour? Against, carried.